best laid plans. Oh my goodness. So I am back. Hopefully you are back too. Gracious. I still see 24, tw a couple people left off, but um, I'll make sure this is recorded as well. Sorry about that, everyone. I had to switch my cameras. We're back, we're back, we're back, we're back. Okay, here we go. Is everyone back? All right, I lost all my questions. So if you guys have questions, you have to retype them in. <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and I have a few questions people have actually emailed me ahead of time. So I'm just gonna go to those and if you have questions, go ahead and type them in and we'll just uh, keep it going here. Okay, so um, important things, first of all, um, my student seems to be spending a lot of time online. How can I help balance that out? So, well, that's a great question. I think, again, if you can plan things ahead of time and you can make sure that you have a platform that your, your students are always going to to get their agenda items, you can certainly make certain suggestions for how they should be spending time offline. But I would be very clear with those types of instruction. So you definitely want to make sure that you're not just saying, for example, read for 20 minutes. Not helpful. You want to be clear. Read this book for 20 minutes and tell me, be prepared to tell me about this perhaps. Um, it's Kids are really needing a lot of structure and families need more guidance than you think that they do. So be, be very precise with that. Um, somebody's just written in and said, what apps do you work with with Google Classroom? So I work with a lot of apps because I actually link to sources of content for each of my students. In the course that I wrote, I detail all of the apps and the different things that I use a lot of and how to use them. But just to give you a few, I use Learning A to Z to source leveled reading books. This is a really helpful platform for students to read books. Um, I also do the um, Brain Pop uh, for different videos for content. I use Starfall for the little guys, and we use, um, let's see, there's a whole bunch of them actually. Um, I use the Smart Exchange, which is a smart board exchange that you can get lessons off of the shared files or you could create your own for lessons that I'm doing with students and I have a whole bunch more but I'll definitely post this also on my website in terms of other different apps that you can use to source the content. I really think the way you need to organize this is in this this order. You need to figure out how you're going to deliver your instruction. So this is using Zoom right now. I use Zoom to connect with my students. I can record on here. I can um, share my screen and I show you how to do all of that, but you can use Zoom or you can use Google Meet. And the advantage of using Google Meet is that it's integrated into the Google platform. So everything just gets saved into your Google Drive. And if you want to share a recording with your students, that can be an easy way to organize your communication. So it just depends on how you want to deliver. Then you should have a second tier where you organize your content, like a landing page, where every time you teach, you go to that landing page, whether it be the Google Classroom or the Padlet or Seesaw. These are just areas that you can go to to, sort, to put all of your links and your documents and the, your content onto that your students can then access as you're teaching. And then the third thing is you can actually teach your students through content. So you can source content from learning A to Z or Brain Pop or Seesaw or Starfall or you know all of the shared areas that we have to do uh, the content with. So that's helpful. Um, then let's see. I'm concerned that pro that I'm providing a lot of instruction that is student led. 
how do I provide more meaningful lessons to my students, especially if I have a lot of students? So I kind of talked about that in the case study component with the second grade teacher, but I think the best thing to do is to assess your students as you would in a teaching situation, but you're gonna to have to be creative because you're online. So you might ask the students to create their own video if you've taught them how to do that. Or you might give them a Google form, which is a really easy thing to set up and do. You might have them fill in or submit a writing piece on Seesaw and grade it or on Google Classroom and grade it. So get an assessment together and then divide up your groups into smaller groups so that you can teach to that group and provide them with this type of engagement where they can ask questions, where you can dialogue, where they can see you in addition to their own independent work. So it's not enough, for example, to give a student a bunch of papers to read and do questions and answer questions. You have to also engage with them around that work and gain feedback from them to see if they're actually moving through that work properly, right? So, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Um, okay, what if I am tutoring and my family seem not to need me right now? So I sort of did cover this before a little bit, but what I wanna just emphasize here is that families do need you. Families need teachers right now, families need tutors right now, and you need to deliver in the way that you can using your strengths to families right now. So figure out ways that you can um, add value to the lessons that you're already doing with students and produce small videos, produce small chunks of work that you can give to families to help them with their needs. Pull your families, talk to your families, ask them what do, you, what do they need, right? So um, let's see, uh, somebody's asking what is Padlet and how do you post on Google Classroom? So Padlet is, if you go online, just go on padlet.com. It is really fun to play around with. You can use it for free and it's basically a wall on an online platform and you can post it note different cards for your kids. I use it to do two things. One is I use it to organize my lesson flow for students in tutoring. So I'll put a card up and I'll say, the first thing we're gonna do is check in on your work from school. The second thing we're gonna do is answer your questions. The third thing we're gonna do is work on our mini lesson skills that I'm trying to address holistically. And then I'll include any links that I need on that Padlet. And I put everything in Google Classroom for my kids as the storage component for all of my lessons. But you can also just use Padlet. The, the good thing about Padlet is that you can also just take the URL and share it direct with your student and your student can access that same wall on their computer. So the other way I use Padlet is in studying for standardized tests or for tests. If I wanna organize a student to study, I'll take a screenshot of the content I want them to learn and I'll put it on a Padlet card and then I'll have the student re-answer the question, let's say it's for math, or I'll have the student comment on the little piece of text and, and get them active somehow to be active, actively studying using the Padlet cards. But you can use Padlet for lots of things. And the other thing I like about Padlet is that you could customize the look of Padlet to really connect with your student. So remember, it's always fun when the colors are your favorite colors, or there's a little emoji that you got to pick out, and there's some sense of style that you like. So Padlet offers those little customizations that I think are kind of necessary for teaching and individualizing instruction. I also started experimenting with using Padlet with the second grade teacher that I'm coaching, and she started using it with her students just to schedule their days, because you can use the timeline feature, and she was able to have conferences with each of her parents. I mean, this is like I, I just think this is where we need to be because she's really thinking outside the box in terms of meeting her family's needs, the whole family, not just the student. So she, she actually did a call with each of the families and kind of asked them questions about 
How are things going? What do you need from me? And in that engagement, she took notes and then she started to populate the Padlet with little things like um, one of the kids was having trouble with eating. I think he was feeling nervous and we just decided to help encourage him to be in a, in a role of responsibility around that. So he got to pick the things that he was having and he would report back on the Padlet to the teacher. So just like little things like that make a huge difference for a family, right? And Padlet just is an organizational tool that you can use to deliver the really good ideas that you have in meeting your students' needs. Um, in terms of Google Classroom, it's, it's, I go into this a little bit more in depth in the course, but posting things on Google Classroom is also super easy. I just urge you to go, if you go onto your Google email, if you, if you click on those nine dots, icon, you can go down and it has the classroom there. And if you just hit classroom, you can make a classroom. Now I'm, I'm tutoring. So I'm very careful with my students' identities and I don't want to share their identities with each other. So I create a separate class for each of my kids that I tutor. But if you're teaching, you can use Google Classroom for your class, let's say, and they can engage with each other as well, which is kind of a cool thing. And it's also neat because everything is on your Google Google um, Suite stuff so you could easily organize it and share things. But um, you can post things there for students to read. You can also have parents be on it too so that they could see what's happening. You can grade things and have feedback. So there's a lot of really cool functionality for the Google Classroom. Yeah. Um, so how do I support, uh, here's another question, how do I support the parents in my class or my tutoring practice. Yeah, so I think there's a really strong potential and this is where I feel like, again, I feel particularly suited to offer something to you in terms of this question because I am a parent, but I also work with plenty of parents and support them with their kids, right? So I think it's really important that you ask them how things are going. They may not be able to articulate everything, but be curious as to how things are going. I was finishing a session with one of my kids and I could tell the mom was just like at her wits end with what was happening. And so I just text her and said, call me, just call me. And so we just had an offline conversation. I listened. She was able to kind of vent through some things. And then I said, you know, I have a, I have a solution for that. Let's try this instead, or let's do this. I think I could help you there. Right. So just offering those intimate kinds of conversations and really staying plugged into the families that you're serving in individualized ways and not making assumptions either. Like I have, you know, there's, I, I do this all the time. So I'm like only human, right? But like, I do make assumptions sometimes that some of my families need this or they need that. And it's always really very valuable and very interesting to call them, not an email, or text them and just say, how are you doing? How are you doing? What, what can I do to help you? It goes, it goes so far, right? So if you, if you want to have one action step for this weekend, do that. Organize that for this week. It would be really great for you to do. Um, but other ways to support parents. I think parents are really overwhelmed right now. And I know from my standpoint, for example, I've had many moments like this where I'm on the phone with somebody or I'm trying to give my full attention to a student and my kid comes in and I'm like, get out of here, please. You know, I'm trying to fo stay focused on work. And so a, a teacher coming online like this and talking with my kid and giving them their 100% is like a gift. It's so fabulous because I know that my child has that attention that like, quite frankly, they need, they really need that. And they need to engage with other, other humans really besides just me. I'm getting a little boring. So you can do that, right? You can check in with the kid. Like maybe if you check in with the parent, you can say, Hey, can I get on a FaceTime call with whoever and just say hi? I mean, that's amazing. Yes, you can. Of course, please do. I, five minutes. That would be amazing, right? So those are things you can do to support parents. Um, you can also, you know, think outside the box. I think we all need help with what we're doing. As I mentioned earlier in the, in the webinar, this is a big change for everyone. This is not normal. This is not what we normally do. So we don't know. I'm a teacher. I have a lot of parenting skills. Thank goodness. I can teach things pretty, pretty well. But a lot of my families have, are, are not teachers. They're not with kids all day long. And we are, we are teachers, we're tutors. We choose to be with kids all day long. So I think you also have the potential to reach out to families and just have empathy because it's, it's not that they're a poor parent. They just have a different 
skill set. They're, they're, they're perhaps doing a different kind of job all day long. And being with their kids 24 seven is a really new experience. And you might need to bring it down to their level and make things super simple. Don't overcomplicate it. So when I'm teaching kids, for example, like executive functioning or something, I'm not starting with the most complicated process or skill to have them enact, right? I'm bringing it to the most basic, basic level possible and just letting them get comfortable with that before I add la layers of complexity. So if you see a parent just getting completely overwhelmed, jump in and say, you know what? I think we're overcomplicating this. How about if we back it up and let's just cover the basics here. Let's give this kid two hours of work to do during the day. Quite frankly, I think that's a good amount of work. If you think about it, if kids are in school for six hours a day, how much instructional time in their seats do you think they're really having? Not six hours of the day. So we cannot expect them to have that much time sitting at their desks in front of a computer. So I think we also have to be the voice of our profession right now and really explain to parents what their their expectation should be right now. This is a great time for us also to teach parents about parenting. We can tell them, you know, your kids need time to play. They need time to be bored. It's okay to be bored. You can learn a lot from being bored, bored uh, from being bored. And that's a go ahead, take that one and write a great blog about it. Go ahead. I bet you it'll go viral or everyone will benefit from your ideas there. And your kids will benefit from the ideas of what are they doing when they're bored? We bought jump ropes. My kids have jump ropes and they are coming up with the most amazing things to do with these jump ropes. They have created contests. They have tried to jump rope and put them together. They have made forts with them. They use them as doggy leashes. I mean, this, this is amazing, right? So if, if you see something happening in your home, you can maybe offer it to your, your parents too and just give them give them as much of this as you can and that's where your value comes in. Um, parents need a lot of support right now. It's, it's overwhelming. Um, so let's just say I wanted to create content right now. Um, where do I go to do that and can I sell it? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of ways you can sell content. Um, I haven't really created a lot of content. This is my first go at creating an, an online course. I'm doing two of them actually. I'm doing this one is already up. It's uh, how to tutor online and it has really as 12 modules. I did videos and I showed everyone how to do the delivery, the organization and the and how to source your content for your lessons. And then I'm doing another one that's going to be finished. I'm aiming to have it out on Wednesday and it's about how to deliver instruction to students with special needs. So I'm really digging, doing a deep dive into innovative ways to do this with kids with special needs. So these are ways that I'm doing it and I'm using a program called, um, I'll put it on the, I'll put it on my website. It's a K A B A J A I J I I think, Kabaji, I don't know. Anyway, uh, and it's an online course creation templated kind of thing. And it was super easy to use. And I could have learned how to do it on WordPress, which is where my website is, but I didn't have the time. And it's super easy to use the, for anything that's, you know, templated and easy to use is, is kind of where you need to be right now. Um, in addition, you can use other, other um, content that I put on the course. A lot of these programs have the ability to create your own and sell it on their platform. So for example, um, the, I'm trying to think, Boom Cards is one of them that I have on there. Um, the other, I'm trying to think of a couple. There's of course teachers pay teachers, but I feel like you get like pennies on the dollar on that stuff. I, I'm not really a fan of, of, of teachers making peanuts if, if that's another, part of my platform. Um, I think it's important that we elevate our profession by charging the dollar amounts that we have curated in our brains. Um, but you can always find great worksheets there. And if people could up the, the pricing, I think that would be helpful. Um, it, let's see. Um, I also think you could uh, sell things um, you know, to your families. You could definitely create certain courses and things that would be beneficial for them. I would just urge you to keep it real bite-sized so that it's not overwhelming and bring it down, bring it down to the basics if you do that kind of stuff. But creating content right now is where, where it's at. It's a great way to use this downtime and it's super creative. Yeah. Um, so I hope this was helpful. I will definitely make sure that this Q and A is tied in with the other part of the webinar that I, uh, my internet went out 
course during all of this. So isn't that exciting? Um, and so we were, we were stopped in the middle and we lost a few people, but I hope that you have found this helpful. I would urge you please to just connect with other educators in your life. You can share this with them. You can share your ideas with them. Please collaborate, please support each other. I hope that you are inspired today to move forward now in the next few days to take care of yourselves first and foremost, to recognize that this is a challenging time and to move forward with some new skills and some new ways of looking at your potential as an educator. That's what this is all about. I really um, also would love your support in checking out the online courses that I am putting online. You can look at them and find them on our website. I have also links there to our free newsletter for the Evolve Teaching School, and that is a program that I am doing with teachers just to support them in their work and to elevate our profession. So I will sign off now, and if anyone has any last minute questions, I'm happy to answer them if you want to just type it in real quick. Otherwise, I'm going to say see you later and have a really good Saturday. Try to be positive and, and helpful.